We are visiting our old friend, the Standard Combat series, uh, for this next playthrough. This is one that I've wanted to get to the table since I bought this game, Rostov 41, Race to the Dawn by MMP. Um, this came out not too long ago, and I think is the newest entry into SCS right now. Um, so I'm not going to go over the uh, all the particulars of the actual system. If you want to see that, go check out my video on Karelia 44, where I talk about the system a little bit. Um, and I'll leave a link to that in the corner up here. Um, but you know, if you, if you've played SCS or you've seen the other video, you know what you're getting here. You know, you're getting extremely simple rules, really fast playing gameplay, uh, not a lot of overhead. Um, and this one in particular is probably on the simpler end of SCS games. Uh, it's like 10 pages of rules, including the actual game rules. And there's not very many special things happening in this game. It's just going to be a slugfest between the Germans and the Soviets. And you're going to get sort of that East front flavor here, um, in really quick playing package. So uh, let's talk about uh, what the game's about and how to win and the two factions and all that good stuff. So first of all, the game is 14 turns. The end of 14 turns, um, the winner is going to be decided by victory points. The Germans, who you can see sort of here, and some SS um, groupings, some units coming on from the west, uh, they are going to score points for taking control of various uh, Soviet uh, cities and positions. So for example, if I... Here's uh, Novo, Novo Cherkask, I believe is how you pronounce this. So this is a city worth five points at the end of the game if the Germans control it at the end of the game, or it's worth two points if they have at some point in the game moved through there. Um, even if they lose it, they'll still bank two points there. Here's the titular Rostov. This one is worth, I think, 15 points uh, if the Germans control it. Yeah, if they control, I think every hex, all five hexes, they get 15 points. Otherwise, they get five points if they've entered it at some point during the game and uh, Bata Batesk here, uh, and so forth. So these three you'll get points for if you just enter. Other uh, cities on the map for the Germans, uh, so Shakti up here, again, five and two. Um, and then you've got things like Stalino up there is worth three if the Germans control it at the end of the game. And there's some more in here. Uh, basically, the Germans uh, are going to want to spread out across this map and take control of as many cities as possible and try and hold them till the end of the game. The Germans win if they have 14 or more points uh, at the end of turn 14. Uh, but they can also lose points, and they can lose points by losing units, and um, they can also lose points by having uh, Soviets uh, on the western side of this. Let's see, uh, which rivers is it? It's I believe it's this river, the Krinka, and this river here, the Mias, uh, I believe is what it's called. So the Germans want to drive the Soviets back across these rivers. Uh, the Soviets, for their part, um, they don't start with a lot on the on the map. Uh, these are all pretty much single stack units, and the Germans are typically double stacked here. Uh, but as the game goes along, the Soviets going to get a lot more reinforcements. And sort of the the asymmetry of this game that's going to make it kind of an interesting space to play in is that the Soviets, uh, their reinforcements are going to come in all along the edges of the map over here. Basically, three of the four edges of the map, the Soviets are going to be able to funnel units in. Germans only going to get their uh, reinforcements from this side of the map. So the Germans are going to be facing sort of a, a counterattack from multiple angles, um, and they're also trying to push through here and take uh, Rostov and its surrounding areas as quickly as possible. Um, and then they've got to hold that, and they don't get nearly as many units as the Soviets do. Now, the difference here in force, which is, is interesting to me, um, the Soviet units here are all one-step units for the most part. There are a couple that are not, and you see, anytime you see this yellow dot, it's a two-step Soviet unit. But by and large, most Soviet units are one step. Um, and German units, by and large, mostly two-step. You can also see that a lot of the German units, in fact, most of the German units, if you go all the way back, are all exploit-capable armor units or mobile units at the very least. So they're going to be able to overrun and do uh, exploitation overruns and attacks as well. Uh, Soviets, mostly infantry, rifle divisions, rifle regiments, uh, they are not going to be able to do that. And so the Germans are going to be highly mobile, uh, and highly uh, uh, deadly because they're going to get to attack. And they also have an additional bombardment phase during the turn for their artillery, like you see here and here. Um, now, the downside is that artillery actually cannot wipe out the last step of a unit. So probably artillery not going to be doing a lot of casualties to the Russians. Uh, but they will, It will, however, be able to disorganize them to lower their uh, strength. Um, so it's going to be interesting interplay between the Germans really racing through here, trying to stretch and grab Rostov. Uh, and then turn their attention northwards while, um, you know, the Soviets trying to slow them down as much as possible. The other enemy for the Germans, and as you would expect in the East Front, is going to be the weather. So you can see that the, um, the weather 
can uh, there will be some weather checks on specific turns, um, and we can go for, to mud, which is going to slow the Germans down quite a bit. Uh, clear, freeze. Um, essentially, uh, the ground is going to be changing, and that's going to be changing the situation for the combats and uh, mobility for a lot of these units. So uh, the Soviets have kind of a challenge on their hands to start with, but they're going to get stronger as the game goes along. And the Germans, really, most of their forces are on the map, so they that's what they've got to work with. The Germans do lose points at the end of the game for units that uh, are eliminated. And um, so they're going to want to make sure that they're not throwing stuff into combats where there's a chance that they can get hit, as I said. Uh, and that's basically the game. That is Rostov 41, I think, from a strategic perspective, um, you know, from, from the German perspective here. Um, I... I'm not quite sure. Stellino is just sitting open up there, not very defended, and there's a lot of mobile units here. I'm thinking once we kind of mop up this little trio of, of rifle regiments, I think they're regiments, rifle companies maybe, um, can't see from here. Uh, once we mop them up, we, we shoot these guys north, we grab Stellino, we start to control some of these roads and railroads. It's going to be tough for the Russian reinforcements uh, to really make it down to the hot spots if we can sort of control these roads. As you can see from the map, not a lot of terrain, uh, mostly clear, which uh, will suit the Germans just fine because overruns can only be done in clear terrain. But the hills, hexes that you see up here are column shifts, and there are some other terrain. There's swamps down here. Those can also turn into column shifts. Um, so it should unfold rather interestingly. Um, as the Soviets, I'm probably looking to... Um, you know, I probably don't want to hold any of these lines super heavily and, and throw away manpower uh, and leave sort of Rostov open. I'll probably want to, uh, you know, start to back these guys off pretty quickly, uh, defend in maybe some of these swamps. Um, you know, there's not there's not really a good defensive line here uh, on the approach to Rostov. So, you know, this might be the best chance. I don't know. We'll see. Some of these units in the north, they're going to get a chance to move as well. And uh, where they go is kind of an interesting decision because they could start moving down here into the German rear. Um, at the risk of not having really any defensible positions and then suddenly leaving it open for a German counterattack. Uh, so we'll have to see. We'll have to play it by ear. Uh, I guess the first thing I need to do since we're going to start <clears throat> is uh, roll some initiative. So it is clear weather on the first turn, and uh, that means that the Germans do get a, a plus one to the initiative uh, determination. So uh, I'll show you one more thing here before we start. Let's roll up the initiative. Um, I should have specified which die is what. Well, Germans are, you know, white and gray, obviously, and the Soviets are red. Yeah, come on, what am I thinking here? So, Germans win initiative on turn one. The other thing that happens here is the difference between the initiative rolls, five to three, the difference there is two, and much like Karelia 44, that is going to give uh, the side that wins initiative uh, some number of air barrages. Um, and so we come down here. We've got three air barrage counters here. Soviet side, Russian, uh, German side. So the difference was two. The Germans get two barrage markers. I'll put them here on the turn track to remind us. And they'll be able to use those. Interestingly, in this game, you've got sort of an OCS uh, kind of approach to the air game here. The uh, Germans can use their air uh, in many different phases, not just the barrage phase. They can use it during movement. They can use it during enemy movement as well. So you're kind of, you're kind of getting a, a simpler version of OCS's kind of hip shoot. Um, functionality where aircraft can do things during turns, um, during exploitation, during movement, during Soviet uh, actions and whatnot. Um, so uh, that that can have a nice little interrupt effect and maybe DG a, a unit that's going in for an attack, they're sure to win and suddenly they, they don't. Anyways, that's where we start. I'll get to, I'll get to moving all these units and um, I will check in when things take a turn for the interesting. Uh, so real quick, just overall, pretty uh, encouraging and um, effective first turn for the Germans. They broke through this line pretty easily. They DG'd uh, basically every line along the river, managed to punch through, got some exploit attacks, overruns happening. They've surrounded the units they couldn't attack and uh, have basically broken through to Taganrog, which they're going to try and take next turn. The Russians now uh, got some units trapped. These units who relatively safe... Um, got to figure out where they're, where they're going because they don't really have the strength to come in here and attack. Really, the only setback for the Germans was this unit here. There was a stack that attacked this undefended artillery unit and uh, just went 
horribly wrong in these uh, artillery. <laughs> so artillery unit forced them back across and that caused this hex to overstack, which then DG'd them, which ruined an exploit capable stack here. Anyway, it's not a big deal, uh, but the, the Germans have broken through. They're headed towards Rostov as fast as they possibly can. A couple of these anti-tank units um, separated from their artillery and moved up just to block off this, uh, this road, put a zone of control in this road and park in these hills and uh, block off this railroad so that these cavalry, these two-step Russian cavalry couldn't link up with the defense down here. So uh, they don't want to risk coming down <laughs> behind and then suddenly be surrounded by all these these Germans. Over here, less successful, not as much artillery, and uh, an attack that was basically inconclusive. Uh, so instead, the Germans have just decided to kind of surround these guys with zones of control and force them to fight their way out if they want to get back into supply. Um, otherwise, face the consequences to that. And meanwhile, the uh, the SS uh, Viking SS unit uh, formation over here has taken off up this this path, this track to Stellino, um, and these guys are probably going to have to figure out a defensive position uh, to at least provide a speed bump for them. On the next turn, the, the Germans are going to get uh, some uh, pretty good reinforcements coming up along uh, this rail line, um, and the Soviets obviously are going to get a ton. I think, uh, I'm not sure if they're going to get any here, but we could see a developing battle around Stellino um, in the second turn. But first, got to do the Russians, and um, they need to uh, get their stuff together because it's not uh, very organized right now. Here we are at the end of turn two, the Germans making, uh, I don't know if great progress, but certainly they have uh, mopped up this whole center resistance area. There's really nothing left, neither uh, along the river line over here either. Um, there's sort of some reorganization happening here as some of these uh, sort of vanguard units speed down this highway towards Rostov, uh, primarily trying to get there and sort of surround the back entrance if they can before these uh, rifle uh, units come in who arrived this turn on the map. It's going to be real key to see who gets the uh, initiative role on this next turn because if the Russians get it, they'll be able to pour units into Rostov and then it's going to be difficult for the Germans to crack uh, quickly. Um, up in the north, I don't know that the Germans have any real necessary motivation to go attacking this way. There's really one town here and there's another town over here uh, that are worth some points if they hold it. I just don't see the Germans being able to hold those locations. Maybe maybe this one, because it's in the hills, um, but they'd have to commit significant force to do that, and they'd have to fight through sort of these, these hilly areas, and I'm not sure that they want to do that. They want to leave enough forces here to dissuade the Russians from trying to come down and maybe cut supply, but um, I suspect that many of these forces are going to peel off and head towards Rostov on the next turn. Um, this sort of rear guard uh, formation that was busy dealing with this finished up there piling down the highway, trying to get there as quickly as possible. And then meanwhile, up here around Stalino, we've had some reinforcements come come on at Alexandrovka. Um, they've moved up, and then we've had some, uh, the, the Viking SS uh, formation moved up uh, and is getting ready to essentially kick these guys out of there. Now, the Germans do have to be careful because there are going to be some Soviet reinforcements heading down this road on the next turn. So again, initiative going to be critical. But as you can see from the state of the board, the uh, German overrun and exploitation capability is absolutely dominant um, this far, thus far through the game. The dead pile looking uh, numerous and varied in here. This um, this armor unit uh, got sort of made a bad move and got kind of trapped and caught out got hit with some artillery and then got overrun. Um, so, so this is where we stand at the end of turn two. We're heading into turn three, and that's going to be the last guaranteed clear weather turn. After that, uh, we may have mud, which could slow the German advance quite significantly. Uh, we just made it to turn six, and um, <clears throat> the Germans on the last turn, uh, some, some critical happenings here. So uh, the Germans got real lucky with their bombardment rolls. Um, they managed to DG this stack in the city, which is uh, tougher to do than if they're out in the open. Um, and they finally managed at the end of last turn to cordon off Rostov. So all of this in here is the city of Rostov. The Germans have fully surrounded it and cut off sort of these reinforcements who are headed down from the east. Um, that's going to, uh, there's going to be sort of uh, engaged in a double envelopment here as soon as the Russians can make it down and sort of like push up against these lines. So it's going to be uh, kind of a push and pull battle. It'll be interesting to see. What happens, but uh, what's just happened actually at the beginning of turn six is that the Germans won initiative, which was huge for them because that's going to allow them to attack this single DG reduced two step unit here and possibly uh, make it into the city <clears throat> for the first time and sort of shrink this perimeter, um, which they badly need to do and they need to do it quickly. We're almost, uh, what, we're more than a third of the way through the game and the Germans still haven't made it into Rostov. I think um, potentially some mistakes that have been made is that they didn't bring, um, they, they split off some of the forces that could have been better used to, to penetrate the city here because this is obviously the biggest source of points. 
Uh, but with the initiative, um, they are going to manage to be able to make another attack here, potentially. The mud weather has really slowed things down. So every German unit you see here um, is a motorized unit, black movement factor, and mud halves their attack strength everywhere on the map. And so it is really hard to get factors against some of these defense, defending hexes. I've, they've tried three turns in a row to bombard here. They know there's a two-step unit in there. If they can just roll well enough, they can reduce it. But it's been real tough to bring strength to bear. And... Um, and uh, so they're trying to make a go of it, sort of chipping away at the perimeter, which is the slower way, but the, the easier way to do it um, uh, eventually. Hopefully they don't run out of time. Uh, but the mud is also playing havoc on other things. So uh, because they won initiative, they were able to get their last big batch of reinforcements uh, coming in from uh, the west here. Sorry about that. Um, the west here. So this entire, uh, this the 60th motorized infantry um, division, probably, maybe the uh, they've entered the map along with some independent units and they're racing down this highway as quickly as possible. You can see here that this bridge has been cut, uh, so they're going to have to go around. But the mud has reduced this from a uh, quarter of a movement point to half of a movement point. And so, um, you know, who knows when they're going to make it. It's probably going to take them two more turns to get to actually get to Rostov. Um, so, you know, uh, that they're, they're speeding as quickly as they can, but um, I'm not sure they're going to be able to make it in time before the, German, the Russians collapse. Uh, but they're going to try. Uh, this has devolved into a bit of a stalemate here. Not enough strength on either side to sort of get across these river lines or these hills. And the Germans really are just kind of sticking around here so that the Russians don't try anything. Um, there is a two-point city here. You know, maybe they can get to it. They've got the Russians have a couple of two-step units. You know, they've thought about using this artillery to bombard and maybe get lucky and reduce some of those units. But um, really, with mud, um, there's also a limit on the number of artillery strikes you can do per turn. Thankfully, the, really the only thing that's been keeping the Germans in it is that they've been rolling really well on that roll, and so they've been able to um, get three bombardments a turn, and they just got another three bombardments this turn. Um, so that's really, really uh, basically allowing to keep the pressure on. Uh, and then finally, uh, we go up here to uh, Stalino, where the Germans have had a ton of uh, leg movement uh, or non-motorized movement reinforcements, I guess that would be like, um, come into play up here and um, have been, you know, trying to surround this and pocket this sort of Russian formation because if they can do that, they can start to get out east and uh, start to get behind sort of this, this stalemate here and capture some of these cities before Russian reinforcements come on. Now, unfortunately, this turn, the Russians are going to get a whole bunch of stuff uh, all around the map. Um, they're slow moving, so there's still a little bit of time. Um, but you can see, again, trying to get combat factors uh -huh, on some of these stacks is proving to be very difficult, and they haven't wanted to use their, their valuable, valuable um, bombardment, artillery bombardments here because they just don't have the strength necessarily right now. This, this stack here is attempting to kind of move around and maybe sort of chip, chip this out of the way and then you know slowly strangle a supply out of here if they can get some units around the back. Um, that might potentially uh, be able to work out. But... One of the things I think the Germans maybe should have considered at the beginning was having these Viking SS units head towards Rostov that I think would have helped them uh, have a little bit more punch down there. Instead, they're kind of bogged down up here in Stalino on the western edge of the map and not a lot of progress is being made. Um, then no small part to the fact that a lot of these reinforcements are pretty weak units. So um, it's slow going. It slowed way down. The mud roll was probably uh, a really bad uh, turn of events for the Germans. They haven't lost any units yet, which is nice, but they're going to have to maintain that so they don't lose points. You can see that we've got two more turns of mud, and then there's a potential for it to be clear here. But if they don't get this roll, then it's going to be mud all the way to the freeze check. Um, and, uh, yeah, so... Um, the weather is is looking a little uh, a little iffy. One thing I do want to ask here: the rules are the rules uh, are kind of strange in that they say something to the effect of like turn, and it's not in the errata, but they say that like turns in the parentheses are ones where you check for weather, and if you make the check, the weather stays what it is based on the rule until you do the next roll check. It's weird to me that they would print the actual weather on some of these turns because it conceivably means that you're in mud. You try and go to clear, you don't make it to clear. You try and go to freeze, it doesn't make it to freeze, and you just have mud all the way through the winter. That may be what's intended, uh, but I'd be curious to know sort of if there's any sort of follow-up about the weather here. The rules seem to be written understandably and pretty well. It's just strange that they have these um, these these turns where it specifically says what the weather is, but it's possible not to pay attention to that. So anyways, uh, that's where we are sort of at the end of October. Uh, Germans continuing the push. They can get If they can get into Rostov, um, you know, there's a chance. So we'll see how it goes. All right, we're starting turn nine. This is the end of November. Um, lots of interesting stuff happening in each of the particular hot zones on the map and just some disastrous turns of events for the Germans. So first of all, first of all the um, second chance for clear weather in the game on turn eight, 
uh, the Germans rolled weather and it stayed mud, which means it's going to stay mud until everything freezes on turn 11. Now that could help or hurt the, the Germans because what's going to happen on turn 11 is once things freeze, a lot of the swamp terrain becomes enterable and the, the Don River here freezes over and so uh, units will be able to cross over it, which will allow potentially the Germans to get behind. Now, the problem that the Germans have right now, and it's a big problem, is the Soviets have massed all of their reinforcements down here around Rostov uh, and are starting to encircle the Germans' encirclement. And um, they basically have one narrow supply line running up this railroad right now and that they've got to protect at all costs because if they don't, so suddenly everything in Rostov is going to be out of supply, which is maybe poor thinking by the Germans, but they didn't think they would be in this position originally because this stack here was DG'd on the last turn. So they had five units surrounding it, five stacks to attack there, and they rolled horribly on their attack roll. It ended up doing a casualty to themselves. They didn't do any damage there. Um, and ultimately, they really needed that. If they could have gotten that, uh, they you know might have stood a chance. But as it stands now, they're in just a really vulnerable position. The reinforcements that were coming down the road, there's just with all this mud, there's just not enough time for them to get uh, as quickly as they should be able to all the way up here to sort of keep these supply lines open. To top that all off, we just rolled initiative for turn nine and the Soviets won initiative, which means they're gonna get to move first, which means this is gonna get really dicey uh, in here. Um, and uh, this may cost the Germans the game potentially. Um, and if not the game, it certainly it will be the end of the offensive uh, portion of the campaign. Um, so that's kind of what's going on along this axis here in the south. The Russians are going to get a giant stack of uh, reinforcements again this turn and again the next turn as well. So not looking great for the Germans. Um, up here in the middle, this uh, this formation here has been trying to play clean up and knock out these uh, Soviet units here that are uh, west of these rivers because obviously those are going to be negative points at the end of the game. They managed to DG this unit here. They also rolled they rolled snake eyes on this attack, which I think was a three to one, and um, ended up taking a, a loss uh, from this, I believe. So this unit now is still uh, still holding this town, which is Uspenskaya is what that town is. Um, which is worth two points for the Germans if they can hold it at the end of the game, but uh, this one lone reduced cavalry unit here is holding out pretty nicely. Um, and then up here, uh, sort of, uh, the Germans have been able to go on the offensive and are kind of staging a breakout out of Stalino. Um, they managed to get enough units to threaten an out of supply uh, for these sort of weak defenders. Um, and so they've kind of put up a screen to prevent these guys from coming around behind. In the meantime, they're sending the uh, SS Viking formation up the road uh, to try and, you know, push off these guys, which they have been doing a pretty good job. They've been using their mobility to kind of try and get these units out of supply. So they've had to back off. Ultimately, their strategic objective that I've decided for them is to get to Krasny Luke. If they can do that, they can probably hold that because it is in the mountains and it's going to be really tough to push them off unless they get surrounded. Um, if not, we're going to have sort of an engagement and a battle in here. I don't believe any of these villages are worth points. Uh, this one's worth two. So in the near term, you know, maybe they're thinking they can try and take that there. That would be a big help to them. Um, I'm not sure how many of the reinforcements this turn are coming on in the E zone or the F zone. Um, if they do, that could certainly put the brakes on that. Uh, but in general, it seems like the Germans are getting the brakes put on them uh, no matter where you look on the map. Uh, and certainly in Rostov, uh, it is not going well for them. So uh, they may be delayed and dithered a little too long. They potentially, you know, didn't get the rolls that they needed at the right times. The back of the box does say that the Germans are going to need some luck, but they have entered two of the hexes. So at the very least, they will get points for those. Um, really, they wanted to get across the river to Batesk, and that is still certainly possible once the freeze rolls around. Even if they get pushed back, they might be able to get down here and kind of circle around. So the Soviets can't um, celebrate too early, but uh, right now they are sir, uh, operating under the assumption that a lot of these German units are going to be out of supply and then they can start picking them off pretty easily. So uh, we are into sort of the late stages of the game and the Russians are going to have a ton of reinforcements to enter and move this turn. So I will get on with that and then I will check in uh, shortly. Uh, turn 12, end of November, 1941. The Rostov situation is just an absolute mess. <laughs> the Soviets completed, uh, almost completed their uh, in encirclement of the German position. The Germans have had to fall back, as you can see, basically holding uh, one part of the city here. They've got just this extremely stretched line of supply that goes all the way back. Some reinforcements have managed to make it up the road and actually uh, butt up against the Soviet cut here and actually put this stack out of supply, which is bad news for the Soviets, but they're going to get a chance to react to that. 
But uh, yeah, the Soviets have completely uh, stopped cold the advance into Rostov. The Germans couldn't get enough strength mustered, especially with all this mud. Uh, really hurts them. <clears throat> The weather in particular, and I'm, I'm going to talk about the weather in a second, but the weather in particular suits the Soviets' needs just perfectly. When it's mud, all mechanized uh, units with black movement factors get halved attack, and so the Soviets or the Germans just could not push into the city. And now the Soviets are primed to be able to attack at full strength on some of these stacks. They've got tons of artillery. They've been rolling well for bombardment. Um, it is uh, sort of a nightmare come to life for the Germans here. Uh, they're still holding Rostov, though, so... Uh, <laughs> We're going to see what happens here in the final three turns. This will probably be the last check-in before we get to the end of the game. Uh, but in general, across the map, the Soviets have uh, completed their pushback. Really the only success the Germans having here in the center. They finally managed to take Uspenskaya, which is going to be points at the end of the game if they can hold it. Um, and they may try and clean up this unit here. The Soviets actually <laughs> ran off a cavalry behind the lines um, to just kind of park it. Uh, behind some of these rivers and score uh, takeaway points from the Germans at the end of the game. No one's going to be able to catch him. He's pretty quick in the mud right now. Um, so sayonara. Um, and then finally, here in in the north, the Soviets, again, trying to do an encirclement around the Viking SS units and uh, almost actually succeeded. So they've had to pull back. And this eastern advance along the northern road has basically been called to a halt. There is going to be no more... Um, attacking really um they did try and attack here but uh didn't get any result even at max max table max five to one odds uh so just kind of a sign of the times for the germans about how everything is going um and so that's where we stand with three turns left to play i'll knock those out and then i'll come back the one thing i did want to talk about real quick in regards to the weather i just want to go through this one more time to make sure that i'm doing this properly so game started clear we got mud we had some mud turns we got to this check for weather. The rules say it stays mud until the next check. We checked. We did not get clear. We rolled a one through three here. So by the way that the rules are written, I believe that stays mud, right? We don't get this clear weather here. So we're mud, 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 mud. We got up to the freeze check. I rolled that. I rolled a three. So I assume it stays mud uh, and it never actually freezes. So we just get a really wet and kind of temperate winter. Now, someone who's watching this video who's played Rostov, let me know if I'm doing that correctly. Um... Because it being mud for the whole game, basically, has just screwed the Germans big time. And I think this game would be going very differently. It would be much more even, I think, um, for the Germans if we didn't get all that bad weather. So, um, you know, I, I think the Germans still have a chance here, um, you know, to maybe win a marginal victory based on the victory point schedule. But uh, it's going to be real tough. They're going to have to have some rolls start going their way. And obviously, as you can see, they're going to lose points in here if these units get eliminated, if they're not able to break out, which is looking very unlikely. They're out of supply. They're caught on the east side of Rostov. Soviets have sort of split the German army. So uh, not looking good. Not looking good whatsoever. But I guess that's World War II East Front for you. Update. Never a good sign when you need to go fishing into the bag for this many DG and out of supply markers. Another update, reinforcements from the 60th motorized have managed to open the way for this narrow, narrow band of supply to get into these units who are still holding the western reaches of Rostov, even as the Russians pour into the city. Uh, it's gonna, <laughs> the Germans desperately need those points because their dead pile right now has grown by leaps and bounds this turn, and they're going to get negative points for all of these uh, two-step units uh, that have been eliminated, so they need to hold that. Uh, so we're coming down to the wire. It's the final turn coming up. All right, final attack of the game uh, for the Soviets here um, who are trying to break this hex that the Germans still control in Rostov. It is actually only a one-to-one -one attack. Despite all of these units surrounding it, they can still only get one-to-one. -one. It's, it's two-to-one without the city terrain in there, but uh, even with the DG, it's a one-to-one -one attack. So this is their best bet. They got to roll really high here. Even then, I don't think they can force them off. That's a pretty good roll. They rolled a uh, DR1, which is a retreat. Now, in this game, you're allowed to take step losses instead of retreats. If the Germans lose a one-step unit here, they've got a, yeah, so if they lose this unit here and hold their ground, that means they're going to maintain control of that Hex and Rostov. So they managed to, they managed to get a toehold, a sliver of the city uh, at the end of the game here. Um, and actually, while I'm looking at this, even though it doesn't really matter, um, this unit is now out of supply there. Um, so there we are. The end of Rostov 41. Um, 
this is sort of what the map looks like at the end here. You can see nothing much has changed since the, the game went to mud, and I have some thoughts on that. But, uh, you know, uh, here we are down here at Rostov. The Germans managed to cling, cling to some points there. Uh, up here in the middle, the Germans just never could get their momentum going to, to get, take control of that town. They did get Uspenskaya, but um, they just didn't have enough force uh, in the center there, which maybe if I played this game again as the Germans, I would commit a little earlier and a little more force to the middle to just kind of take it and clean it up so it's not a threat. And then up here, you can see that the Germans in the process of falling back towards Stalino, the Russians, uh, right up against that river line. That would have been where the, the Germans would have sort of defended there. The Russians, not a lot of strength up here, uh, so it likely would have been a stalemate for a while unless there were some good artillery rolls from either side. But obviously in mud, you're only getting, you know, a D6 divided by two number of artillery rolls a turn. So you're never, they were never going to be able to bring any of that stuff um, to effectively, you know, DG those stacks. So uh, that's where we stand. At the end of Rostov 41, we've made it all the way to December 2nd in this game. Um, let me calculate the points here real quick, and I'll tell you who won the game, and then I'll give my final thoughts. Okay, well, when I calculated the points, the Germans ended the game with a whopping negative five points, which is a decisive Soviet victory. As you can see, uh, there wasn't really any doubt about that. I actually misunderstood some of the Rostov scoring mechanics here. In order to score the 15 points for Rostov, the Soviets need to actually control all five hexes at the end of the game. It's all or nothing. If they control one, they don't get anything for that. But they do get the three for entering Rostov at some point. So, um, you know, ultimately they, that was never going to happen. About halfway through the game, the Soviet or the, the Germans made their last biggest attack they could. They failed, and uh, they just could never muster enough force to, to bring it back. So that's Rostov 41. Um, all right, what do I think of Rostov 41? Well, first thing, um, as an SCS game, this is probably one of the simplest SCS games, if not the simplest SCS game that I am familiar with. So if you're looking to get into Hex Encounter Wargaming, this is, and you've never played a Hex Encounter War game, or you're looking to get into SCS and you've never played SCS, or you're a casual gamer who's interested in historical war games, um, mainly if you're a beginner, uh, Rostov 41 is a uh, great starting point for you. Uh, low counter density, as you can see, I know it looks, I know Rostov looks a little intimidating here, but you know, this is really like 50% of each side's army sort of fighting over the most valuable spot on the board. Um, you know, this is super easy to pick up and learn. Um, there's very little learning curve. The total rules, the series rules, plus the Rostov 41 specific rules is like 10 pages or something like that. And it's, it's all very, uh, it all makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, uh, so in that sense, you know, there's not a lot of terrain. In that sense, I think Rostov 41 is the perfect entry point if you're looking to get into MMP's portfolio, but you're intimidated by what they have. This is definitely not OCS, and this is definitely not even Karelia 44, which I had a video on on the channel. It's the first video I did on this channel. Uh, Karelia, a lot more involved and a lot more kind of special considerations in that game than you'll find here, although they do have a similar air system. Um, not as many exploit units in that game, but the terrain is a lot harsher. Um, so yeah, you really can't go wrong with this. I, in general, I really like this game. Um, you know, it plays really fast, uh, really low player friction, like I always say. Um, I think the one major problem I have with it is had that there is a chance that it can be unbalanced. I'm still not convinced that I was doing the weather rules correctly. I still don't understand why these turns have weather listed on them. Um when it's possible that these don't matter. So for example, we did get mud and yes, these are all mud turns, but then we got here and we didn't get clear weather. So these, it doesn't make sense why these would be labeled clear because these are all mud. And again, these are all mud because I failed the freeze check. So I'm still, I still don't know what to think about this. The fact that I got a game where it was clear for three turns and then it was mud for the rest of the game really made it not fun to play the Germans. You start the game with this really awesome force of Germans who are able to exploit really high mobility, they're able to overrun, they're crushing the Soviets, and if you get unlucky and, and you know, you get mud and then you fail these rolls for the change in weather, it just absolutely crushes any momentum that the, the Germans are going to have. It not only crushes their momentum, but it takes away a lot of your player agency. It halves the attack strength of all your motorized units, which is essentially all of the German army, with the exception of some stuff up here. Um, it prevents you from doing exploit phase, it prevents you from doing overruns, you essentially become this really impotent force, um, just kind of motoring around, not even motoring, crawling around sort of Russia, around the Sea of Azov. And um, all of your sort of decision options and all the sort of strategic options you have coming into the scenario just kind of disappear, which is really unfortunate. Um, so the fact that that can happen, I think, is a weakness of the game. I think it would make more sense 
if when you did these checks, it was just this specific turn that it was like, okay, we might have muddy weather early or we might have another turn of clear and then it automatically goes to mud. And in fact, the, the weather track seems to indicate that's how the game was originally designed, but the wording in the rules goes, it runs contrary to that, which is so odd to me. And I don't know if that was like a last minute change or the text in the rules is wrong or they didn't get the map right. It, it just, it's so weird. Um, it's so weird that the way that the weather rules are written. I think, you know, if I were to play this again, I might house rule it that the only variable turns are these ones with the with the um, the die roll and, you know, succeed or fail. It's only for that turn. It doesn't last all the way till the next check, um, because I do think there's a lot of fun to be had here. Um, you know, this obviously if you're playing the Soviets, you're sort of just uh, being crushed at the early in the early turns. You don't know how you're going to win. You don't know how you're going to fight back. You've got all these tiny units that are worth nothing. They move slow. You know, but by the end of the game, they become a formidable force, especially when you get your artillery into the game um, and, uh, you know, you can surround the Germans and uh, sort of like pick them off. Uh, look at the dead piles. Speaking of that, um, here's oops, let me focus that. Uh, here's the Soviet dead pile, you know, a couple armor units in there, mostly infantry. Uh, and actually, probably a lot of these would not have actually been in here. When the Soviet non-motorized infantry units die, um, there's a roll to see if they come back to 50-50, that units come back in the game. And I rolled definitely not uh, above average in terms of Soviet eliminations. Germans, artillery here, lots of uh, one-step mechanized units. Some, uh, here's some more one-step mechanized units. And then, you know, a bunch of two-step mechanized units here as well. So uh, Soviet's definitely capable of putting the herd on late game when they can concentrate their forces. Um, you know, uh, what else do I have to say about this? Um, would I play it again? Yes, I'd like to play it again face-to-face. -face. Uh, I might house rule the weather, like I said. Um, you know, but in general, you really can't go wrong with Rostov 41. I would say this is a nice sort of introductory um, addition to anyone's SCS collection. And I think from here, if you're looking to sort of expand your SCS um, both in complexity, but also scope, you might go into something like the Mighty Endeavor, which is essentially, uh, you know, 1944, 1945, East and West Front. Um, that game is huge in scale, but it has sort of a similar uh, complexity scope um, outside of sort of the beach landing stuff in Normandy uh, to this, you know, more terrain and stuff like that. But um, you know, all in all, you can't really go wrong with SCS, and uh, this is no exception. So thanks for watching this. Um, I'm curious to hear your commentary and thoughts about how this game unfolded uh, for the Germans, just disaster after disaster as we got into sort of turn six and seven there. Um, and yeah, I will be back soon with some more um, something. I'm not sure. I did see today that on MMP's Twitter account, they, uh, they got, they're starting to get all of the components for third winter, OCS third winter into their warehouse which I am extremely excited for. You can bet your ass that as soon as Third Winter arrives at my house, we're going to be opening that up and playing some of the smaller scenarios um, on camera. I'm very excited for that game. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and, you know, you know, I, as, I, as I think about that, I might do an S, uh, OCS game before Third Winter arrives just to get refreshed on the rules. I was thinking about doing Sicily. I haven't actually played... I've played a scenario out of there, but I've not played the whole thing, and it looks, you know, pretty manageable for... Um, for uh, one person to tackle. So anyways, like I said, Rasta 41, there you go. Thanks for watching. Talk to you soon.